Hi, I'm Lee Kelso, host of the Health Call Live Radio Hour. Glad you're here to learn what happens when you donate your body to science. I think we're all aware of the concept, but what are the details? What happens when you make that donation? Can your family step in to block you? Can you change your mind? Where does your body go and how is it used? We're going to find out all of those things and more today as we talk with Kelsey Byers. She is the Anatomical Education Program Director at the Indiana University School of Medicine. You have a fascinating job, Kelsey. Tell me something I might not know about body donation. Sure, Lee. Well, thank you so much for having me. As you said, I am the director of the Anatomical Education Program, which is the statewide whole body donation program uh, facilitated through IU School of Medicine, but serving any academic institution that utilizes human remains in a cadaver lab. Um, something someone may not know about body donation is that when you're donating to science, uh, whole bodies are utilized by medical schools to teach anatomy, but what we are not doing is tailored research. We're not going to be able to say, directly promote the finding of a cure for a certain disease. That may be important to a donor's family and they may think they want to donate their loved one's body to that particular effort. But what I like to say to them is to turn it around and think about that donation furthering medicine as a whole. So educating incoming young doctors, dentists, physical therapists, physicians assistants, and helping those future healers uh, work toward medicine as a whole and finding those cures as um, a scientific community. You know, I guess I'm kind of surprised that um we still need bodies. Uh, it, you know, it seems kind of an analog experience as opposed to doing it through some digital virtual reality kind of scenario. What's the advantage of actually having a body in the lab with me to learn with? Sure. At our program, we like to say that we foster the humanity in human anatomy. And what that means to us is that uh, there's a certain element that you can't get from a textbook or even as good as some of the virtual atlases may be, um, that that's a resource to look to, say, a virtual dissector and be able to zoom in on structures. Uh, those are very cool. But first of all, how did that get made? It got made through somebody's anatomical gift that was a body donor, uh, but also for our students, we think of our donors as their first patient. And we're trying to graduate well-rounded healing healthcare professionals. Uh, so we want them to stay in touch with the humanity of their first patient and their own humanity and um, to connect on a personal level, I guess, and to have that tactile experience, um, body donation and the ultimate dissection that happens at the medical school is a rite of passage for these students that um, we think attracts them to the universities in Indiana that are able through our, the generous gifts of our donors to offer them that opportunity. Yeah, I guess in the old days, people may not know that there were grave robbers uh, who collected bodies from medical schools. And, and, and for example, if there was a medical school in your town, it was kind of known that sometimes the bodies used there weren't exactly donated, right? So thank goodness we put right. on that. Um, so let me just be clear about that. Are, 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 my, are the students who are going to be working on me, do they know me? Do they know my name? Do they know anything about me at all? They know some limited information. We keep it um, within the confines of HIPAA and how uh, we would treat just in any other healthcare context, personal health information. So the students that are working with a donor, they will know the donor's sex, obviously, their age, um, their occupation the cause of their death according to their physician on the death certificate. Uh, we do not share during the course personal identifier information like names or the town you're from, but families and students can share that information after the course has concluded if they choose to. So when I'm uh, in, in the dissection lab, uh, is it going to be one group of students that I'm going to be working with this whole time, or is my body kind of shared among a group of students? 
A little of column A, a little of column B. Uh, a first patient is assigned to a group of usually four to six students that are assigned to that pod. They'll work specifically with that donor, kind of take ownership of that donor uh, through the course of the semester or the school year. However, uh, we do have obviously an opportunity to learn from each other. We do peer teaching in our labs. So that may mean that the students are shifting around to see interesting structures all throughout the lab and in that way get to you know, take advantage of all of the gifts that have been made. But generally speaking, there's one first patient uh, to a group of four to six students. How long am I going to be um, in that lab? How long will you be using my remains? Our program can take up to two years from the time of death through to the cremation and return to the family. Um, it can be as short as a couple months. It just depends on the needs of the school at the time and what classes are forming. Uh, but we like to make sure that all donor families are aware up to two years and you'll hear from us uh, at the conclusion of the class. And then what happens? I'd assume you're returning, I'm assuming you're cremating my remains and then returning them to me, but, but then what? How does that happen? Sure, yes, all donors are individually cremated at the conclusion of their lab, and then we contact the next of kin with a letter. Uh, we have found that you know in two years time, phone numbers change, addresses might change, so we find it uh, most reliable to reach out with a snail mail letter and we wait for that letter to be returned to us. It's kind of a form where the donor family will specify their preferences and uh, sign it and return it to us. And the options there are to return an urn with an in-person appointment. You can come see us at our offices in Indianapolis and we'll sit down with you, talk about the class that your loved one was a part of, return the urn with the cremated remains. Uh, most of our families, since we're a statewide program, can't necessarily pop over to Indy easily, so we utilize the United States Postal Service, and they do have a very regimented structure. Those packages are well marked, um, and they're handled accordingly. They they know that we have human remains uh, inside that securely boxed urn, so we send those with signature required and insured. Um, and the final option is for donor families to allow us to lay their loved one to rest at Crown Hill Cemetery here in Indianapolis. We have a section that's dedicated to um, memorialization and a space for reflection. So any donor families are welcome um, to visit that site. It's section 41 at Crown Hill Cemetery. And we invite donor families who lay their loved ones to rest there to join us for a graveside service every fall. Is there, uh, is there any cost advantage to me? I assume I can still have a f traditional funeral if I want to. In fact, I know that's true. But is there any financial benefit to the donor at all? If donors come directly to us and don't go through a funeral home, uh, the university will cover all charges from the pickup to any embalming or preservation that takes place to the eventual cremation and return and involvement in our uh, various services of gratitude. Um, if you do have a traditional funeral service, which I'm glad you brought up, that is a possibility. You can look at body donation instead of as an alternative to a funeral, it can be an alternate form of disposition. So instead of going to a cemetery for burial or directly to a crematory to be cremated, the body can be sent to the medical school for use with the anatomical education program for up to two years. And then that cremation, um, those costs would be covered by the university. I get it. So I have a traditional uh, observance, uh, viewing whatever I wanna do in, in my own family's choice. And then the funeral home contacts you and then you take over from there, correct? Correct. We'll need to be in contact with the funeral home from the time of death, mm -hmm. uh, since we do have some slight tweaks to the embalming process that will need to take place. But most of the time, since our donors need to be pre-registered, the family will know ahead of time uh, that this is the wish. And then if they're planning funeral services, they kind of get everyone all involved. But the funeral home um, can definitely call us 
any time to get those embalming instructions and we'll work together to make sure that everything moves seamlessly for the family. Well, let's talk about that process and procedure just a bit. If I decide that I want to do this, there's, I'm sure, paperwork and other things that need to occur, but let's get to the other side of that for a second. Can I change my mind if I decide I want to do this, but later, eh, I'm not so sure? Yeah, absolutely. Things change. People move, uh, get remarried, priorities change. Kids step in and say, oh, mom, do you really want to do that? Um, and at any point, any registered donor can call us up and let us know or um, revoke their permission, their certificate of bequeathal in writing. And we will happily unenroll anyone who's decided that body donation is no longer for them. So that is what you call it, bequeathal. Okay. Interesting. Uh, so Old fashioned. Yeah, it is sounding old fashioned. You're right. <laughs> so, uh, so you would never know though. I mean, if, when I pass away, it's up to my family to notify you. So if they don't want to do this, they can kind of muck things up, right? That is true. We do rely on somebody to call us to report an enrolled donor's passing. So at the time of registration, we're going to supply our donors with a letter stating uh, that we acknowledge their registration, thank them for their altruism, and we also send a wallet card. So similar to the heart on your license that denotes you're an organ donor, this is something you can have right next to your license that states you're a whole body donor, has our phone number there. Um, but we do rely on a healthcare professional, a first responder, or a family member to give us a call at the time. So for families that aren't quite on the same page, there is a possibility just to not go forward with the donation at that point. We do hope that donors, when they register, discuss this with their families and make sure that everybody is um, has their questions answered and everybody's on the same page. Yeah, so you don't put this in your will because the will is going to be dealt with and probated long after it's too late. So you've got to have... You're more than welcome to, but... Yeah. Yes, time is of the essence. Right. Um, so it is imperative that our paperwork is completed and um, on file ahead of time. And um, yes, I wouldn't rely on uh, the will being read in a timely fashion. We, we try to have our donors here with us in Indianapolis at our facility within 24 hours of their passing. So I have uh, moved away. I've lived somewhere else. Um, die somewhere else, does that still make me eligible to donate if I feel that commitment to IU? There are uh, academic body donation programs in all 50 states. And at this time, we are not accepting donations across state lines. You do have to pass away in the state of Indiana in order to come into our program. So what I would do in that case is um, get out my Rolodex and recommend uh, an academic program at a different medical school closer geographically to where the person has passed away. And where does this process start? I'm assuming online I go to your website, which we'll show everybody and put the link in the description below, but uh, how? what's that first step? Perfect, yeah, most people uh, still call us, just ring us up on the phone and ask for information. We mail out a lot of information packets that has the same information that you'll find there on our website. So that's a frequently asked questions. We want you to read through and make sure that that answers any questions you might have about body donation or our program specifically. And if everything sounds good, um, fill out the two forms. There's a certificate of bequeathal. That's the legal gift. We want two witness signatures on that form. And that's the individual person filling out uh, their name, address, social, date of birth, and stating their intention to donate their body for education to the anatomical education program. And then a secondary form that helps us do things after the donation has occurred, like stay in contact with the family, complete a death certificate, um, so more demographic information. So we ask that those are mailed to us. Oh, sorry, Lee. No, go ahead. You, you asked them <laughs> uh, We'd like mailed. those mailed to us so we have original signatures, and then we'll return to that enrollee a letter and a wallet card. What would disqualify me if I still want to have 
uh, be an organ donor, for example. Is that possible in, in this uh, process of bequeathal? The most that one can donate to an outside organization would be the eyes. Corneal donation or whole eye donation is okay. It doesn't interrupt the anatomy that we need to have in place uh, for our educational uses. But any more invasive interruption of the anatomy like an autopsy or donating organs or tissues beyond the eyes, unfortunately, that would disqualify someone. Is there There anything? are also... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I keep interrupting you. Okay, right. uh, there are also height and weight restrictions and some certain conditions. So we have a list of infectious diseases, which does include COVID-19, pneumonia. Um, we'll run through a list of infectious conditions to make sure none of those are present. Um, the body donors must have a body mass index or BMI calculation of 30 or below. So what that looks like for us is a maximum height of about six feet to six feet one inch and a maximum weight of 220 pounds. If you're shorter than six feet, that maximum weight goes down right. and you can do a web search for a body mass index calculator if you're curious. Yeah, there are a million of them out there. Um, <laughs> so tell me about who donates, what, you've met these families, you, you know these people, um, what do they have to say about the person uh, who made this gift? Usually that they are the kind of person that would give you the shirt off their back. Uh, we hear that all the time. The majority of our donors seem to come from a teaching background. Either they were in healthcare themselves and benefited from a first patient, a body donor, or they were a teacher and see this as an opportunity to continue that legacy even after they're gone. Um, we also hear a lot about how deeply impacted our donors have been by the IU health system. That motivates a lot of people uh, to seek us out or their physicians may recommend uh, body donation to them as they're discussing their final plans. We, um, in, in doing the research uh, that brought me to you, I discovered that there are a number of not-for-profits and maybe even for-profit corporations out there that are co kind of broadly known as body brokers. Um, how, is, how is what they do different than what academic programs like IU does? I really appreciate the question. Uh, I'm part of a national task force that's working now with others uh, in my same role at other medical schools to draw that distinction in the law. So academic body donation is always done not for a profit and for the purposes of educating the next generation of healers that come through our distinct institutions. Body brokers are in business and the business that they run is um, selling the product that is human bodies or human body parts. Uh, while it is a donation to science in that they may have criteria for who utilizes this human tissue, um, it's not the same in that they are profiting off of donations and they aren't overseen like an academic institution is by an internal review board. They aren't governed by state or federal statute. So I would caution anyone exploring body donation to be sure that you understand whether you're going to be part of an institution with a reputation or well, let me help you out with that. I, yes, I understand please. you're trying to be very delicate about this, and I understand. I understand the need for that. Yeah, I get that. Uh, but let's just tell it like it is. Some, in some cases, bodies are disarticulated. Is the phrase that's often used. So they are segmented, mm -hmm. and one part might go here, another part might go there. They might be used to train orthopedic surgeons. So you may have a portion of the body with that joint going someplace to be used in training for that. Um, there is also processing that occurs. Um, there, there are a lot of different ways. The body, our human body has a great amount of value and there are people who have discovered 
that. Mm -hmm. So what's the question I need to ask if I, if I, if I, if I do connect with somebody like that, what, how do I know the right thing to ask about how I want my body to be used? Right. Well, you can ask about it simply, as you said, how will my body be used? Will my body be kept whole? Um, if that's important to you. Some people may not be bothered, as you say, the, the process of disarticulation that could take place. Um, however, I think it is incumbent on any of us as we're exploring these options to uh, be sure that we understand the ethical standards, ask questions about will, are your donors treated with dignity? Are the labs that they are sent to uh, inspected? How is all of this overseen? And see if you're comfortable with the answers you get to those questions. Let's wrap this up with a sense of just how important is this to a medical student? Our students, I don't think they know going into the lab how impactful this is going to be for them. Year after year, I work with the students the semester following their experience in the lab we convene a committee and I work with the first year students to put on our service of gratitude. And that's their opportunity to, uh, we invite all the donor families from the donors who came to us in the previous year and the students address them um, either through reading an essay or sometimes they feel more comfortable expressing themselves with art or poetry or music, but we're able to put together a unique service every year to honor those donors and communicate to the families how much of an impact those donors have. I know I have talked to my personal physician about the cadaver that he learned from in medical school, however many years ago. It's, as I said earlier, a rite of passage that these students are gonna remember and take forward with them. So every patient they touch, uh, a little part of their healing presence and whatever they're able to accomplish with their career is going to be due to that gift that the body donor made to allow them to get that education. Well, it is good to know you will forever be in the memory of a doctor or other healthcare professional. Kelsey Byers, thank you very much. Appreciate your chat with us today. Fascinating topic. Love to know more, but time's gone away. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Lee. It was a pleasure.